Good morning. I'm Tim. This week we'll be looking at lessons from the life of Joseph. Now Joseph was a young man who uh, was growing up and he had a situation with some of his brothers. And we're going to take a look at that in Genesis chapter 37 verses 5 to 10. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? We need to know that through this, that God will give us supernatural information that he knows. God moves through people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in supernatural ways. He dispenses spiritual gifts by his Holy Spirit. And these gifts are used to proclaim God's plan, to help God's plan unfold. And we are not to be mockers like Joseph's brothers were. God had given this information to Joseph supernaturally. He was giving a proclamation ahead of time of something that would come to pass. And if his brothers had more of a sensitive heart, they would have recognized, wait a minute, this is of God. But they didn't. And so we need to have a different attitude than his brothers. When God is using someone supernaturally to pass on information or to do something to bring about his plan, we need to not be mockers. We need to go, okay, wait a minute. If this is truly of God, we need to pay attention. And so that is lesson number one. And in keeping with lesson number one, there's also another verse here. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 20, it says, Do not treat prophecies with contempt. And so let's keep that in mind as well for this first lesson. Lesson number two. Let's look at Genesis chapter 37, verses 23 to 28. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. Talk about having a bad day. First of all, sibling rivalry goes to new heights, and Joseph gets thrown into this big pit, so life was the pits for him. And then they decide, oh, Let's sell him into slavery. Imagine if that happened to you. 
you're being sold into slavery by your own flesh and blood. Talk about a bad day. Now, the lesson that we're going to be looking at in this part is that God allows troubles to make us what we need to be for our calling. Now, at the time when Joseph was thrown into the pit and he sold into slavery, he couldn't see the big picture that God had in mind. All he saw were the troubles. He just saw the troubles. But God had a bigger plan. And God was using these troubles to transform Joseph, to make him into this great leader that he would be eventually. Well, let's see what else God allowed in order to transform him. It says in Genesis chapter 39, uh, verses 16 to 23, um, now this part here, it's when he was sold into slavery and he was put into this household of this man called Potiphar. And Joseph served in this man's house. And his wife, Potiphar's wife, decided that she wanted to have relations with Joseph. We'll put it that way. But Joseph refused. And this is where some more trouble came Joseph's way. She, Potiphar's wife, kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison... The Lord was with him, and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care, because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So here he is, falsely accused, thrown into prison, not exactly a good day at the office. But God had something good in mind for these troubles. Again, as I said before, God was transforming Joseph to make him into the leader that he would become. In this situation, you notice that when he was in prison, he was put in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. This was important preparation because eventually Joseph would be made ruler over a much greater thing than just this prison. So here he had a ch a, a, an opportunity to grow in responsibility to run something that would be under his command, so to speak, even though he was a prisoner. This was a good dry run for what was to come. And so when you and I go through difficulties, we need to remember that the Lord is doing something special. His heart is only for good. His heart is only for our best interest. And so, when you have something like this, we need to remember to praise God instead of just simply getting upset and saying, what are you doing? A good coach will run his players, run her players through uh, tough situations sometimes in order to prepare them for the competition coming up. If they just let them sit on the sidelines and drink Gatorade and do nothing, have a life of ease, those players would be ill-prepared. But they give them the arduous 
things that they need to go through to be able to meet the demands that are coming down the road in competition. And so likewise, God uses arduous things to prepare us for the things that are coming down the road, for the awesome calling that he has in mind for us. He does not want us to be unprepared. He wants us to be well trained. So when we step into that calling, we're able to do it well. He is a loving God. And that is why he does those things. So Joseph went through these hardships and was well prepared for the calling that he was going to step into. And God brought him into his calling. Now, remember the mocking from his brothers about his dreams, his prophetic dreams? Well, isn't it interesting? Those dreams foretold him being in a position where he would end up being their saving grace. Now let's take a look here in Genesis chapter 41, verses 15 to 32, and verses 39 to 43. It says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. Now what had just happened prior to this was Joseph, when he was in prison, he had two other guys that were there and they had dreams and he interpreted them. God gave him the interpretation of those dreams. And one of the men later on remembered that Joseph, Joseph had given him that interpretation. And this remembrance came about when Pharaoh had had a dream and he didn't know what it all meant. In fact, he had a couple of dreams that he didn't know what they meant. And all of a sudden, this man had the remembrance. Oh, right. Joseph interpreted my dream. Hey, he can help Pharaoh understand what his dreams were about, are about. So this is where we enter in. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Now, in this process of transformation that we talked about, Joseph um, realized, he gained that understanding that it is God who is at work. God is the one who gives him the interpretation. And so he quickly gives credit to God. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, In my dream I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up seven cows fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I had never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. The lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I saw seven heads of grain, full and good, growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. And Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and, se and the seven good heads of grain are seven years. It is one and the same dream. The seven lean, ugly cows that came up afterward are seven years, and so are the seven worthless heads of grain scorched by the east wind. There are seven years of famine. It is just as I said to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. 
Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and the famine will savage the land, ravage the land rather. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made this all known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And the people shouted before him, make way. Thus, he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now, isn't it interesting that God, in the right time, put him in charge? He, at the right time, had Joseph step into his calling. And it's very significant that Joseph was in charge at this time because the famine hits down the road and his family were starving at the time and they needed to come to Egypt for food. Now, as I understand it, the Egyptians wouldn't normally look after shepherds, which is what Joseph's family were. They wouldn't normally look after shepherds. Now, if, imagine if Joseph wasn't in charge and they just came and the Egyptians were in charge, they wouldn't have found the food that they needed. But God called Joseph to this position for such a time as this. And because he was one of them, he did, in fact, meet their needs so they wouldn't starve. And yes... His brothers and his father, his entire family did bow down, just as God had foretold through those dreams so long before. Joseph was prepared through many hardships to be the right kind of ruler during this time. He wasn't, uh, you know, the the bad attitude kind of teenager that he was, God had transformed him with the characteristics and the training that he needed to be able to be the second in command that he needed to be. And his family was saved. The nation of Egypt was saved. There was so much good that came out of this. Now, if we look at our own lives, we can know that God is at work in our lives. When we've surrendered our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, God is at work in our lives to prepare us for a calling that he has. And the calling that he has for you and me will impact many. It will impact many for the glory of God. And so we can know that we can trust God as we keep moving forward with him, that he is leading us into something that is significant for his kingdom. Well, let's look at the life of a lady named Cory Ten Boom and see how these lessons that we've uh, talked about here, how they played out in her life. Now, Cory and her family, uh, during the Second World War, uh, sought to rescue as many Jews as possible from being killed by the Nazis. And they ended up in concentration camps as a result of their efforts because somebody had um, 
told on them. And so there they were in these, these concentration camps. And Corey at the time, like Joseph, couldn't see exactly what the purpose of this was, what the good of this was. Couldn't see that at all. But God certainly used those experiences in a very powerful way in her life down the road. And we're going to take a, a look at one of the ways that those experiences were used. Corey was invited to go to a prison in Africa. And here's the story. Moments later, I was introduced to the prisoners who all sat staring at me in hatred. The steam rose around them and the stinging insects swarmed their mud-coated ankles and legs. I began to talk of the joy that is ours when we know Jesus. What a friend we have in him. He is always with us. When we are depressed, he gives us joy. When we do wrong, he gives us the strength to be good. When we hate, he fills us with his forgiveness. When we are afraid, he causes us to love. Several faces changed and I saw that some of my joy was spilling over on them, but I knew the, what the rest were thinking. After your talk, you can go home away from this muddy, stinking prison. It may be, it is easy for, uh, easy to talk about joy when you are free, but we must stay here. Then I told them a story. Morning roll call at Ravensbrook was often the hardest time of the day. Ravensbrook was the concentration camp that she was in. By 4.30 a.m., we had to be standing outside our barracks in the black pre-dawn chill in blocks of 100 women, 10 wide, 10 deep. Names were never used in the concentration camp. It was part of the plan to dehumanize the prisoners, to take away their dignity of life and their worth before God and man. I was simply known as prisoner 66730. Roll call sometimes lasted three hours. Every day the sun rose a little later and the icy cold wind blew a little stronger. Standing in the gray of the dawn, I would try to repeat through shivering lips that verse of scripture which had come to mean so much to me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That's in Romans 8, verses 35 to 36. In all this, there was an overwhelming victory through Jesus who had proved his love for me by dying on the cross. But there came a time when repeating the words did not help. I needed more. Oh God, I prayed, reveal yourself somehow. Then one morning, the woman directly in front of me sank to the ground. In a moment, a young woman guard was standing over her, a whip in her hand. Get up, she screamed in rage. How dare you think you can lie down when everyone else is standing? I could hardly bear to see what was happening in front of me. Surely, this is the end of, of, of us all, I thought. Then suddenly a skylark started to sing high in the sky. The sweet, pure notes of the bird rose on the still cold air. Every head turned upward away from the carnage before us, listening to the song of the skylark soaring over the crematorium. The words of the psalmist ran through my mind, for as, high, for, uh, as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is God's mercy toward them that fear him. I looked out at the men who were sitting in front of me. No longer were their faces filled with darkness and anger. They were listening intently, for they were hearing from someone who had walked where they were now walking. You see how God had allowed the hardship of Ravensbrook in Corey's life to prepare her to have credibility before these ones who needed to know the Lord Jesus Christ. I bet you if she had not gone through that hardship, 
gone through what they were going through, they would have dismissed her. They would have dismissed her life-changing message. But God in his kindness toward her and toward these prisoners allowed her to go through that concentration camp so that life giving message would be received and change lives for eternity. What is it in your life and mine that God is allowing that's hard, that seems unbearable at times? What is it? Know that God in his kindness is allowing it so that the same life-giving message will be received by the person that he is calling you to meet one day. The people that you will be meeting one day. Let's continue the story. I continued. There in that prison, I saw things from God's point of view. The reality of God's love was just as sure as the cruelty of men. O oh, love of God, how deep and great, far deeper than man's deepest hate. Every morning for the next three weeks, just at the time of roll call, the skylark appeared. In a sweet song, I heard the call of God to turn my eyes away from the cruelty of men to the ocean of God's love. Although I was speaking through an interpreter, God's spirit was working through both of us. I saw joy appearing on the faces of nearly all the men sitting before me. Say, men, I said, do you know Jesus is willing to live in your hearts? He says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I come in. Just think, that same Jesus loves you and will live in your heart and give you joy in the midst of all this mud. He who is willing, raise his hand. I looked around. All the men, including the guards, had raised their hands. It was unbelievable. But their faces showed a joy that only the Holy Spirit could produce. As I left the prison and returned to the car, all the men accompanied me. The guards did not seem worried or anxious that they swarmed around me. In fact, they didn't even prevent them from going out the gate to stand around my car. As I opened the door and got in, the, man, the men began to shout and chant something, repeating the same words over and over. What do they shout? I asked my interpreter. She smiled and said, they shout, old woman, come back. Old woman, come back and tell us more of Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? That God had this in mind when he allowed Corey to go through the hardship of the concentration camp. Isn't it marvelous that all those Men's destinies were changed like that because of the life-giving message of the gospel that Corey was able to share. That she was able to share because of how God had prepared her. So we need to think again. What has God prepared you and me for? What is he preparing you and me for? And so as we go through the hardships that we go through, we need to remember this, that there is a calling that he is transforming us for. And when we step into that calling, we'll be so grateful that he prepared us, especially when we see lives changed for eternity. And so, the life of Joseph, I believe, has been used to teach us much today. And so, 
it's good that we talk to God and say, okay, God, what do you have for me today out of these lessons? What are you trying to teach me? What would you have me apply? In a moment, we're going to have a word of prayer. And it's a good time to have a conversation with God about these things. And also remember, just before we pray, that sometimes God will give us spoiler alerts supernaturally. And when those things come, when he moves supernaturally by his spirit, we need to have receptive hearts. Because God could be giving us something very important that we're in need of. And we need to be able to receive that as well. Well, let's go to prayer as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for the lessons that we can learn from Joseph. And Father, as we come before you today, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts. Let us know how these lessons apply to us. What is it that you want us to pay attention to, God? What is it that you would want to reveal to us, O oh God? Help us to have receptive hearts, Lord. Help us, Lord, when we're going through troubles to praise you and not to complain. Praise you because, Lord, you have something good in mind for us. That you're preparing us, training us, Lord, for something wonderful that you have in mind down the road. Father, help us to trust you all the way. Lord, bring us into that calling that you have for us, that lives might be changed for eternity. And we ask this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Thank you for listening. God bless and have a wonderful day.